uh, I think a large part of society, and especially the court, views me as just being a dirty fag, essentially. Uh, so because of my, you know, uh, because of the fact that I'm gay and HIV positive, the court has decided that all of my rights can just be washed aside. My rights don't matter because I'm, I'm gay and HIV positive. You know, uh, there's so much homophobia going on. I mean, this this law in itself is, uh, you, you know, it's it's homophobic at its root. You know, the issue here is that uh, the court is not following any logical pattern or using reasonable thought here. They the the court, uh, it, it's a witch hunt. It really, really is because we had all the evidence we needed and even more so to be tapped in that wasn't tapped in the, in the trial, but all across the board, it's, it's legal aid, it's my lawyer who put together a really crappy case, uh, you know, it's the arresting officer, they've been believing this, this horrible human being that likes to go and have unprotected sex with, with men less than half his age. There is no fairness here, none whatsoever, none. I, I am the victim. That Canadian law states that if a person uh, cannot consent to sexual activity and their partner knows that they couldn't have consented or should have known that they didn't consent, then that person will be subject to charges. Um, <laughs> part of our, our whole defense has been that I was in a, a, a very intense mentally impaired state when this experience happened. Therefore, I couldn't have consented. But the court doesn't care about that. The court doesn't care, None, no one cares about that. What the court wants to do, what the court cares about is, is, is you know, their pound of flesh. You know, getting even, um, and that's not fair. So in, in, the first, in the first year, my perception of the arrest, I really saw it as an opportunity um, for me to, to have, well, get better, men, uh, better mental health care um, and uh, as an opportunity for me to grow as a person. Now, in the second year, uh, when the pressure just began to build, because there's uh, this hopelessness when you don't know what your, what your future is going to be like, you don't know what's going to happen, this intense sadness kicked in to overdrive and the depression so intense that by the end of year two, all I had was anger toward the court. The humility was gone. You know, in that second year, I really looked back and realized what state I was in at the time. R realized that I was the one being taken advantage of sexually. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't consent because I was completely delusional about my partner, um, about disclosure, about my status, about all of it. Right. So in, in year two, I really realized that, and I got very angry. And now here in year three, we've picked up the pieces. I, I reported myself to public health right after this experience. I signed the document stating that, you know, I wouldn't have unprotected sex. You know, which I guess it, it, it makes sense, and it's completely reasonable, because, you know, for me, safe sex is, is really important. Now that I can have um, a, a sexual life, even though I don't have it much of one right now, I, I have the ability to to use condoms. I do. I think I think they're the greatest, the greatest one of the greatest inventions of mankind is, is condoms, because it can save so many lives, help so many people. So for me, as a balanced individual, healthy individual, non-psychotic individual, condom use has has become. Um, part of my life, and it's and it, it is very healthy, and that's true love. When you use a condom, you, you're not just protecting your partner; you're protecting yourself. That's that's love. Condom use is love for me now, and I, I believe, <laughs> and I, I'm proof uh, that young men are taken advantage of, young people are taken advantage of. Um, I, I hope the the entire world realizes that that you know, condoms are love. That's my view, you know, I hope all the other 20-year-old 20 20 year gay boys out there listen.